Let's talk about daughters who falsely accused their fathers of sexual abuse. This is Jurgen Rasmus and welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. So here's the question. How can a daughter who professes to love her father and have a good relationship to her father in perhaps her, her late teens or early 20s, a few years later turn around and accuse her father of sexual abuse that never took place. How is this psychologically possible? What are the psychological and cultural factors that these sorts of accusations emerge out of? That's what I'm going to be exploring in this video. Now, before we get into it, uh, this is not a video designed to defend fathers who have sexually abused their daughters. Sexual abuse is a heinous crime that should be prosecuted and those who are found guilty through sufficient evidence in a court of law should be sentenced to prison. So I'm, I'm not defending sexual abuse. It is a heinous crime, nor am I defending pedophiles or or making light of the subject but this is about another tragedy and and that is the case of false accusations of sexual abuse now there are two types there there are those who uh, accuse people of sexual abuse that never happened and they know that they're lying right and then you have those who actually believe in these memories this video is going to concern itself with the latter case. Now, we, we know that a certain percentage, if, if we step away from um, father-daughter accusations, if, if we just look at uh, females accusing males of sexual abuse, yes, there are a lot of males who sexually abuse females, and, and that is a huge problem. We also know that there are plenty of false accusations where the person doing the accusing know, knows that sexual abuse never took place. So, for example, a couple of years ago here in Norway, uh, to its credit, a mainstream newspaper called Oftenposten uh, reported one of these cases where you had an 18-year-old girl who was angry at her father. Uh, the parents had issues in their marriage. I, I wonder if the father had had an affair and she had expected to get a particular brand of car for her 18th birthday, which she didn't get. And, and she was angry and immature. She accused her father of having sexually abused her for many years. And the father got convicted to several years in prison before he was later exonerated. Uh, the daughter came forward and said, look, I was angry with my father. I, I made the whole thing up. So there, there, there are daughters, you know, who are angry with their fathers for various reasons who may do this as a form of revenge or, or to seek power in some ways. Of course, if we look at it more generally, I, I, I used to have a, a friend who was a police officer who, who talked to me about this topic, who said, look, um, we've seen cases where, for example, women are, are you know, having affairs and, and to cover that up, you know, they, they, they press charges of rape. Um, and or you, you may have had instances of consensual sex where uh, the man does not want to have any more, uh, you know, sex or, or a deeper relationship with the woman afterwards. When the woman then goes, ah, had I known that beforehand, I would never have consented to the sex. Therefore, it's rape. So we, we know about this. But this video is going to cover something very different. And that is daughters, again, who profess to love their fathers, to have a loving relationship with their fathers. And they, they have no memories or claims of sexual abuse when they're teenagers or perhaps in their early 20s. But later on, they come back with a vengeance, accusing their fathers of having sexually abused them. How, how could this happen? You know, what are the psychological mechanisms going on? Well, let's start with looking at, you know, a, a kind of psychological profile of who does this. 
Now, hold this profile lightly because you will find many counter examples. But most of those who do this um, are white. That's the demographics. Uh, it's usually middle class or upper middle class women who are rather well educated. So they usually go to college or university. Uh, quite a few of them have PhDs. And they, they are often also women who, who have adopted a, a kind of victim oppressor mindset, you know? So it, it may be radical feminism. Uh, it, it might be, you know, far left ideologies, which, which, which kind of views the woman as a victim and, and that they are living in a patriarchy of sorts, uh, where, where men are their oppressors. So, so it, it's an adopted ideology where they have a, a resentment and a bitterness towards men often. And this is often an ideology that they get indoctrinated into through higher education. Um, it usually happens with people also who go to therapy who are kind of psychologically oriented in 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 that sense and um the the accusers are very often in their early 30s so so there, there, there's kind of like a sweet spot from age 31 to 34 where, where you see the bulk of many of these uh types of accusations um, re re regarding these particular women, they are often high in neuroticism and, and they are very often people who, who either struggle with uh, depression or uh, who have been diagnosed with PTSD or who have experienced what they perceive to be trauma uh, in their past. So, so a PTSD diagnosis, uh, depression, and, and, and also panic attacks. These are, the, 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 this is quite typical. And what's also a risk factor are women who have uh, borderline personality tendencies. So, so borderline personality tendencies are women who, who are, it, most of the people who have these tendencies are, are female. Uh, so we're, we're talking about people who have a, a, a deep-seated fear of abandonment, who, who are terrified of being abandoned, and who, who have very unstable relationships, typically, due, due to that, because uh, they're also obviously very afraid of trusting and, and being intimate, right? So it's hard to, to form relationships. Uh, there's often a lot of rage on, and, and there's also wild fluctuations of mood and mind states, which can happen very quickly. So, so a very kind of unstable emotional life with wild mood swings combined with a deep-seated fear of, of abandonment and a very unstable sense of self. Uh, women who have these personality tendencies and who also struggle with, with depression and, and, and who have a PTSD diagnosis um, are more, more likely. Uh, again, be careful with this because you, you, you will obviously find counterexamples uh, to this. Now, when they, when they go into therapy, you know, the, the, the typical thing that has happened, because people, the, the main objection here is, you know, why would someone lie about this? Why would someone make up a story of sexual abuse that never happened? Now, th the thing is, they're most likely not lying. They, they most likely believe in these memories. So what very often happens is that they, they go to therapy and they meet a therapist who believes in the notion of repressed memories. And unfortunately, <clears throat> the memory wars are back. Since 2010, more clinical psychologists believe in repressed memories than they used to before. 2010. So 
there, there, there are more psychologists around today who, who actually believe in, in, in the concept of repressed memories than there were in the 90s. Um, so you, you have a person who, who comes into therapy and who are suffering. You know, they're, they're depressed, they're, they're, they're anxious, they're, they're in a lot of pain. And if you have a, a therapist then who, who, suggests the, who suggests that they may have been sexually abused and that their symptoms are an indicator of sexual abuse, they, they get sold the idea that for them to get better, for them to get well, they have to dredge up and remember these repressed memories of, of sexual abuse, and, and they have to do so to get well. <coughs> if, if someone believes in this, and they buy into that framework, and they start digging for memories, and they, they, they start imagining, you know, now memories can come up. And, and they're very often told by many of these therapists too, that, that you, you need to confront your abuser to, to heal. So that's, that's one very typical avenue, at least in the past, of how these things happen. You know, people would be, be given so-called survivor literature, you know, books like The Courage to Heal, be, be put in groups where people begin to compete, you know, uh, regarding who has the most romantic memories. Their, their identities start to form around being a, a survivor of, of, of abuse. Uh, and, and, and they get rewarded for it. Now, there, there, there's something else, too, and, and that is just the, the, the basis of confirmation bias, that as soon as we start to believe something and we start to act upon those beliefs and we begin to defend those beliefs and argue for them, it's, it's extremely hard to then course correct and to steer the ship in a different direction, right? So, so, so these things begin to take on a life of its own. And, and, and people are very often encouraged to essentially interpret everything as evidence of, of, of abuse. So, so bodily pains, for example, become evidence of body memories. You know, the, the fact that they may have a fear when they, you know, attempt to do a public speech you know, get interpreted as, oh, when, when people look at me with expectancy, you know, th this body memory comes up, which, which is uh, an indicator of, of repression. Um, if, you know, sleep paralysis, you know, nightmares, um, all these sorts of things are, you know, even panic attacks are, are often uh, promoted as flashbacks of, of sorts. Um, so that, 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 that's an important thing too. Now, he, here's the kicker though. This does not, this is not the only way that this can happen. And I, I predict that in the future, we're going to get more cases of false uh, accusations of sexual abuse. There's a lot of cultural factors that are influencing things to move in those directions. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few of those factors right now. So, for example, back in... Uh, so, first of all, since about 2010, um, research by people like Lawrence Petitheath shows that more psychologists believe in the idea of repressed memory. And, and more of the general population, again, believes in these notions. Uh, in 2013, in the fifth edition of the DSM, uh, dissociative amnesia was, be, became a, um, a, a category. Now, they no longer use the language necessarily of repression, but if, if you look at the criteria for dissociative amnesia, it's just a relabeling of what was called repressed memories. So clinicians are trained to, to diagnose this and, and to look for this. Um, 
in our in our culture, you know, in in 2014, Bessel van der Kolk, and I've made a, a video regarding him that you can find on my provocative hypnosis YouTube channel. Bessel van der Kolk released the book The Body Keeps the Score, which has sold three million copies. Uh, it's still on a New York Times bestseller list, and and in that, you know, and he's the king of of the, the high priest or the king of trauma, you know, the whole trauma industry. And in his book, he devotes two chapters to promoting the pseudoscience of, of repressed memories. You have people like Gabor Matei, who has written a number of very popular books, you know, When the Body Says No, uh, his latest, um, um, The Myth of Normal, uh, and in these books are, are extremely influential as well and he's also promoting the idea of repressed memories um, also you know in in our culture as well you know on Netflix you have series like the keepers you have the you know the, the sinner with with Jessica Biel the these all portray repressed memories as as, as something real um, you have meditation obviously has has become extremely popular and meditation based treatment modalities have become very popular uh, in in recent years and there's a movement there to make things more trauma informed so unfortunately a lot of meditation instructors have accepted the claims of the traumatologists and talk a lot about repression. Uh, if you take very famous examples of this, you know, uh, the YouTube channel ZDog MD, um, Angelo DiLulu, DiLulu, who has, you know, Simply Always Awake. I really like those guys. I, 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 I like their videos. I like Angelo DiLulu's book. I think they've had genuine uh, insight into the nature of experience and the illusory nature of self. Uh, and simultaneously, they are heavily promoting the concept of repression. So something that could easily happen is, let, let's say someone's struggling a bit in life and they, they watch, for example, a, a documentary such as The Keepers on Netflix, or they, they read Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, and, and they kind of accept this idea of repressed memories and they're in pain and they're, they're, they're looking for answers and for certainty and let's say they now go on a silent meditation retreat for days where they focus inwards and their internal life becomes you know more uh, enhanced more in focus they develop their sensory clarity and they have this notion of repression you know this is a context easily where false memories may begin to emerge. Now, people like DeLulo and ZDog MD, you know, they, they, they never quite differentiate whether they're talking about suppressing something or repressing something, or whether they're talking about people having known something all along, but then later remembering it, versus if they, you know, go to, let's say, a meditation retreat with no memories of sexual abuse, and then during a retreat or a meditation-based uh, treatment, they suddenly begin having those memories. And these can occur without there being any, you know, suggestions at play whatsoever, right? There, there are other cultural factors as well. You know, these days, the, the narcissism industry is, is very big. You know, I, I noticed this with clients. I made a video, by the way, on Dr. Romani and, and the narcissism industry on my channel as well. Um, she has more than a million subscribers on YouTube. And if you watch her videos, for example, which are very influential, she talks a lot about you know survivor identity and you know to toxic personalities. And th this is the kind of the, the, the same language that was used in the 80s and, and, and the 90s. And she also promotes Jennifer Freud, the betrayal trauma psychologist, who also has been heavily, you know, influential in pushing this idea that if someone's very close to you and, and they abuse you, 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 you kind of, the natural thing is to kind of forget it. 
And then you have young journalists these days with a very feminist, far-left, woke bent who are really pushing, you know, th this notion of victimhood and believe all women, you know, things like rule of law should no longer apply, you know, people should be believed because they're women. And, and there are articles by young journalists, you know, that, that call false memories, you know, just rape myths. Uh, the esteemed memory researcher, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, was canceled at a university in New York after testifying on the nature of memory in the Harvey Weinstein case. You know, uh, law students at the school, the, the university that she teaches at in California have signed petitions, you know, to, to do something about the acute problem of Elizabeth Loftus, because they claim that her research on false memories and her, you know, talking about memory in court, you know, re-traumatizes victims. And, and they, they essentially want to stop her. Um, and, and then you have, you know, even today, you, you, you have more cases uh, in court. Um, there's a, a psychologist and, and, uh, who, who specializes in, in false memories called Henry Utgor in the Netherlands. Who, who talks about there being way more cases now in the Netherlands in, in recent years. Um, and if, if we look at, you know, the, the types of psychotherapy, so here's something else to consider too. You, you, you might ask yourself, you know, why would someone want to believe these memories? You know, and we humans, we, we, we seem to have a strong drive towards certainty and creating meaning and, and being able to create a coherent narrative about who we are and why things are the way we are. So if you look at many of these young women who come to therapy who, who are suffering enormously, you know, being told that essentially that your, your lot in life or your suffering is the result of this repressed trauma, that that's the reason why you drink too much or you, you can't form stable relationships or it's essentially someone else's fault. Someone did something to you. You know, you're a victim. Uh, that identity can be extremely seductive because you, you have an alibi. You, you can still think of yourself as kind of successful or, or you, you, you're a survivor. And the reason why life didn't pan out is because of these repressed memories. And you, you may even get social credibility, especially in a Vogue kind of victimhood culture by being the one who suffers the most. So also people who have narcissistic personality tendencies and, and especially around the what's called covert narcissism or vulnerable narcissism Th these are the more introverted that, that kind of come across as a bit sullen and, and depressed they're, they're, they're hypersensitive to criticism there's a strong sense of victimhood and there, there's an addiction to being special but but they're special due to having often suffered the most and 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 being the biggest victim, you know, and for someone who has these personality tendencies, ending up, for example, in a group where, where you get to establish your, your, your survive, survivor status, your, your identity as the biggest victim, you, you get social credibility for that, can be extremely seductive. So let's have a little uh, look at the forms of therapy where it seems as if the risks of developing false memories are the largest. Uh, one very interesting thing is, again, Henry Utgor, who's a um, psychologist in the Netherlands, he, he talks about in the Netherlands, EMDR being the most popular form of psychotherapy and th there's some data that seems to show that, that the practice of EMDR, where you essentially have someone move their index finger back and forth and you track it with your eyes, th that sort of memory reprocessing tends to take the edge off painful memories, but it also seems to, to increase the danger 
of false memories. So, so he points out research that kind of suggests that EMDR is perhaps the most risky form of these psychotherapies. Now, if EMDR is a big risk factor, then of course other modalities that, that integrate EMDR have to be a big risk factor too. So I'm talking about, you know, havening touch as taught by Steve and Ronald Rudin, you know. Uh, this is a modality where, where you access memories and you, I've been trained in this modality, by the way, and you, you, you do havening touch, you know, like this and, and, and like this, and you also do, do the EMDR. Uh, that's probably also then no better. Here's one by Lawrence Patihis and Mark Pendergrast from 2019. So, um, and they don't mention EMDR, but, but they mention that the, the form of therapy that has the highest risk is attachment therapy and attachment-based therapy. The, these, are, the, these are holding therapies that are often used with kids who, who, who have, let's say they've gotten into, they've been adopted or they're in a foster home or they have new parents and they seem to not be able to bond or show gratitude for their caregivers. So you, you, you have these forms of holding and rebirthing and compression therapists where they, you know, they, they, they get held, uh, where, where rage is provoked. Um, these therapies seems, seem to be the, the, the worst in class. And then you have uh, emotional freedom techniques, you know, which is tapping, which isn't that different from, from havening touch. You'll probably have to add thought field therapy to that as well. This is all about and the interesting thing about this is that they're not that suggestive, right? It's not a therapist suggesting that you remember something that was repressed. But if, if the therapist believes in it and the client comes in with a framework that opens for it, then these sorts of modalities can risk the chances of developing false memories. This is a big surprise to me, the next one, but acceptance and commitment therapy. And of course, acceptance and commitment therapy, I'm a fan of that in general. You know, it... it it kind of takes the best of cognitive therapies and, 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 and mindfulness and acceptance and kind of blends it together. But, but acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, internal family systems, not a big surprise there. Uh, exposure therapy, that one is surprising. Uh, hypnosis, of course, they, they don't specify the type of hypnosis. Uh, survivor groups, then you have behavioral therapy. Then you have 12-step programs, emotion-focused therapy, marriage counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, and actually, very ironically, at the bottom of the list, psychoanalysis. But here's the tricky part, though, in terms of these sorts of lists. Many of these therapists are likely eclectic. So, so even if someone says they do acceptance and commitment therapy or or uh, marriage counseling or, or whatever, they, they, they might still be integrating, you know, many of these other ideas and, and that can influence things. Now, he, here's something to look at too, and that is how do, you, how do you differentiate between, let's call it real memories, memories that point to something that in fact has some basis in reality versus false memories. And again, this is not a perfect list, you know, but one thing to kind of suggest that things are likely a false memory is, let's say someone claims, you know, to remember abuse in therapy that they did not remember before the therapy. So they're 30 years old, they come to therapy, they go through these sorts of processes and suddenly they begin to have memories and they say, this is a complete surprise to me. I never knew this happened. This is likely a false memory. If someone claims to remember, you know, back to the crib or, or being sexually abused at two months old or at, at, at the age of two, this is fiction. Uh, we don't have the capacity to form uh, autobiographical memories, you know, at, at, at that age. Um, if, if memories have a horror movie-like quality, 
like like you begin talking about satanic ritual abuse or torture or really bizarre stuff and let's say someone comes into therapy and they remember you know having been sexually abused by two people and then after four months of therapy it's 16 people you know that sort of stuff which used to happen at a place called Batania Malvik in Trondheim in, in Norway. This is in all likelihood a, a, a false memory. Um, are they, you know, do they seem consumed by anger and rage? You know, ha have they adopted a survivor identity where their whole life revolves around this identity of being a survivor? That's often a tip-off, you know. If 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 they if they've been instructed to break contact with any person or any family member that isn't completely on board with these allegations, and their their therapy group is now their new family, and and they're, you know, that's a that that that's a tip-off uh, as well. And of course, also, do they seem to be looking for financial gains and 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 have these sorts of these sorts of motivations. So what what can be done? Well, you know, a, as a parent, I think, uh, you know, information about memory, you know, because just trying to persuade someone that their memories aren't real, that's likely not going to work. But, but to try to educate, you know, kids on how memory actually works, you know, to, 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 the more you can have quality information about about memory and suggestion and how these things work, the less likely someone will be to, to, to fall for these things. So we really should get uh, these topics into the educational systems. We, we need to spread information about how memory works. Um, that, that, that's really, really important. Uh, and also as a parent, if, if you're child or teenager or young adult, you know, goes to psychotherapy, you know, it might be useful to, to do some research and, and to check out what form of psychotherapy is this and what is it based upon? And is it based upon attachment theories and childhood trauma and repression and stuff like that? In that case, run, you know, you're, you're, you're asking for, you're, you're essentially asking for a, uh, a disaster and of course we, we we need to have memory experts in courts and we need for police officers in general and for law students to be taught about these these topics because very often they i remember many years ago i spoke to one of the more famous lawyers in norway and i asked him you know have you ever studied memory and he looked at me and he said jurgen i'm not a psychologist i'm a lawyer i've studied law but the interesting thing is, of course, he spends all his day essentially using or using and influencing witnesses memories. And there was nothing in his studies whatsoever about how memory works and what some of the pitfalls may be. Anyways, I, I hope this video was useful to you. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you know, feel free to share them. Uh, know that I see clients from all over the world online, so if, if my ways of thinking resonate with you and you would like to explore and see if you and I could be a good fit, I invite you to reach out to me at provocativehypnosis.com. And also, if you're watching this in 2024, I'm doing a six-part online seminar series on how to work with anxiety in all of its flavors with clients. So if that's of interest, go to the seminar page uh, at provocativehypnosis.com and check it out. As always, thanks for listening.